I'm going to go ahead and start the recording and turn it over to Ms. Granger. Super. I'm going to share my screen. And from the beginning, there we go. So thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here. And um, we are going to go through on a little journey first because I wanted to explain how I came to be here talking about fish sauce. And it'll just, just be a little short excursion through my 30 years as a food historian. I started out as a chef. And so I've always had an empirical perspective, a practical perspective on everything that I do. Um, I did an ancient history BA and I met food historians in my in my third year at university when I did my first Roman banquet which was literally cooked by the seat of my pants I had no idea whether it was going to work and I met Andrew Dolby and, and I'm sure you've all heard of Andrew, Andrew Dolby he's a he was a Greek food historian who came to me and said I can't cook and I need somebody to collaborate with on a book and I was still in my third year at university so I was really very lucky and in the right place at the right time to have that that connection and he, he uh, and, and together we wrote the classical cookbook now he did all the scholarship I just did the recipe and I was experimenting with Roman food in my own home in, in a modern setting with mod, mod, modern equipment so I really wasn't understanding Roman food at all, but I was making it taste good and that was the key. So then, then we started to experiment with uh, experimental ar archaeology. So I had um, a flat pack Roman kitchen, which we put in the car with my husband, and we took it from Hadrian's Wall to Fishbourne Roman Palace and all Roman sites in between in Britain. And every weekend through the summer, I was cooking the same dishes over and over again, learning how to be a Roman slave cook, standing in the shoes of a Roman slave cook. So my flat pack Roman kitchen, um, and this on the left is my wonderful Roman kitchen in my garden at home, which my husband subsequently built. But I got a reputation for cooking Roman food that people liked. Um, and Roman food has a reputation for not being very nice. So there was a di disconnect there. There's a confusion over the use of spices because there's so many spices in some of the sauces, eight to ten different spices, uh, four or five herbs, five or six different liquids, fruits. Um, so it all seems too busy and too spicy. And the scholars living in their ivory towers studying Latin, uh, looking at these recipes, just assumed that it was over seasoned and the people choosing those seasonings were the elite saying, showing off about how they can ex afford these spices. And of course, it's also flavoured with this horrible, putrid, fermented, stinky fish sauce that everybody thought was a bit bizarre and strange. So Roman food was completely and utterly misunderstood. And I knew it actually tasted quite good. So that disconnect had to be solved. And the research continued. I was working for the British Museum a lot, doing Roman feasts for them. And I got connected to Butzer Ancient Farm. Now, Butzer Ancient Farm is a reconstructed um, Anglo-Saxon uh, Anglo and Iron Age community. And it has a reconstructed Roman villa with a kitchen. Fabulous place to cook. So many of my experiments took place there. And I did lots of demonstrations, lots of food tastings, lots of meals for people from that site. Very exciting stuff. And we had fun too. My husband built my wonderful kitchen and we dressed up as Romans a lot. And this is a this, this is Chris. And we're at the British Museum doing Roman canapes and uh, and reclining on a fake couch, a very fake couch. And then then the Getty got in touch, and this was a an amazing time. Wonderful sight, staggering sight. Um, fabulous food, very difficult to cook uh, in their kitchens. Uh, we won't go there. It was just a difficult time, but a spectacular event. I did ancient Greek, Roman and Byzantine feasts. And then, of course, I got to the stage where I understood Roman food sufficiently well to be able to say, let's try and retranslate the text, because I knew there was a lot of problems with it. Um, I hadn't been translated since Flower and Rosenbaum. 
and we had a lot more to say. So we, 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 um, we had our publishing deal with Prospect Books and my husband and I together did this text. Now he is still married to me, which is a miracle <laughs> because working together on a book, husband and wife, not easy. He loves Latin, he's a scholar of Latin and he loves Virgil and Homer, Horace, perfect Latin. And Apicius is written in a working, everyday Latin, what they call vulgar Latin. And he was appalled by it. He used to go up to have to run away and read some Virgil after he dealt with Apicius because he couldn't cope with how bad the Latin was. And of course, the little cooking Apicius book, which was my very first book on my own. Then I realized I wasn't, I was trying to reach archeologists with my, with my um, understanding of the equipment and how it was used. Um, but they weren't listening because I didn't have the jargon, the archaeological jargon. So I went and did an MA in archaeology in 2010 and I needed a dissertation and fish sauce had to be it because it was the one thing that was misunderstood, so, so misunderstood and yet so magical. The, the, the um, magic that is umami and the magic that is fish sauce is just such a fabulous part of Roman food and it was seen and such a negative thing. I didn't, it did not compute at all. So the MA resulted in a long 10 year project after the dissertation to do the story, story of Garam. So I had to deal, I was a chef with some degrees, but I was basically a chef. I needed to learn the science of fish sauce. I needed to look at the ethnographic studies from Southeast Asia, experimental archaeology, the archaeology of the amphora that these, these fish sources are, are, are supplied in, the, the archaeology of the fish bones, which are inside amphora, and the archaeology of shipwrecks. And then, of course, it's uh, the, the archaeology of the processing sites in, in Spain and North Africa, and then the texts, both elite satire, uh, things like Pliny and uh, um, other, other didactic sources, as, as well as um, recipes like Apicius and people like Galen, who's writing from a medicinal perspective. So it, it took a long time to get a holistic picture of the nature of fish sauce and to challenge some of the long held beliefs about how it was rotten and stinky and, and elite and expensive and bizarre. And just before we go on to fish sauce, right up to date, COVID times, um, I have a friend with a, with a, with a gimbal, is it the gimbal and the, on a camera, and, and he said, come and let's make some films. So we now have a YouTube channel with Roman recipes, and it's been great fun um, just because of COVID, and I think it'll continue. So it's been quite, quite exciting doing that. So... We are now going to talk about Roman fish sauce. My husband's just come in and tell me he's going out with a dog. I don't need that. So we're going to do a brief chronology. We need to understand how fish sauce evolved before we can understand how it was used in a given context, because it's evolving constantly. There's about four specific changes in, in meaning and understanding of the different kinds of fish sauce through time and very difficult to pin it down. Uh, but fish sauce formed the basis, the backbone of ancient cookery. And uh, we're going to look at that and we're going to look at how it was used and in what quantities and consider its culinary value. So this is the picture we get in the late empire when garum has been long in use in the Roman world. And this is the evidence we get from our recipes, the recipes themselves that survive um, one of them is called the Geoponica. It's the Byzantine manuscript of a text that encompasses recipes and um, agricultural material from right across the Roman world. So it cannot, each individual part of this book cannot be dated, but the, the actual manuscript is 10th century Byzantine. So this picture of fish sauce is, as we see here, you have something called the Quamen, which we see in Apicius. This is equivalent to garros in Greek and occasionally garum, mm -hmm. but not always. This is a whole small fish, tiny fish, left uneviscerated. It's fermented with salt and it dissolves using the digestive enzymes in the viscera into a liquor and a paste. It takes about three months 
the salt levels are very very low, 15% by weight, which um, is very low in comparison with modern fish sauce, as we will see. Uh, natural warmth from the sun, but no direct heat beneath. The sun heats from above. It doesn't heat from underneath. You don't cook it. You don't heat it with, with a fire. You end up with a rich amber liquid, high in protein, used in the cooking process. So it goes in during the cooking process. The cook handles it and it's blended into dressings. The other kind of fish sauce, which is called garum, and the, there's a number of different names. Sociorum is uh, associated with the fact that it was originally made from mullet. And so you cooked your mullet in a sauce of its allies, i.e. more mullet, but a viscera sauce. It's also called melan because it's black and it's also called hymation because it's bloody. So it's the viscera and blood from tuna and mackerel fermented with salt in the same way and at the same temperatures we don't know what the salt levels are, we don't say. And it's presumably for about two months, although there's a possibility that, that these sources, both Lequaman and Garum, were fermented in the Amphora after they were made. But the recipe states just two months for Garum. And it's a black and bloody table sauce. Nowhere do we see it ever being used in the recipes. All the recipes in Apicius requiring fish sauce talk about Lequaman. Um, it's poured onto cooked food, it's poured onto, it's dribbled onto a raw oyster, according to Marshall. And only last week at Whitstable, which is one of the finest sources of oysters in Britain, I sat and had about, about 10 oysters with black garum on it. Very lovely. The only time that I can appreciate black garum, most of the time I am dubious about it. It's not easy to make. I have struggled to bleed mackerel and I would never get an opportunity to, to bleed tuna uh, and so it's not easy to make but there are alternative versions of it uh, sp specifically ishiri which is a Japanese squid viscera sauce. Uh, what you get with this sauce is uh, it's very different from the Kwaman. tastes very different, it tastes of iron, tastes of the blood that it's made with. And it's kind of, I, I say it's got a funky flavour, it's really odd. We, um, uh, uh, I'm not, uh, as I say, I'm not keen, but it was elite. It, it, it was described in ancient literature, in, in the poetry, as being exquisite liquor, more expensive than unguents. Um, we're not going to talk too much about this now, because this is this is the other garum, this is the garum where all that bad reputation comes from. Uh, but it's not the ordinary fish sauce, the Lequaman that everybody used that was traded widely and was, was um, uh, I, I suppose, the fish sauce that is most important in terms of Roman food. So we were, if you want to know more about garum and how it was used, we can talk about it afterwards. But this is the distinction. So we go back to the beginning and look at how that came about. Fish sauce in fifth and fourth century Greece, that's where we start. According to um, Greek drama, garos was the name of a fish, a particular fish, but it was also the name of a fermented fish paste made with undervalued tiny anchovy and, and sardine that the fishermen were, had, to, uh, had to consume, that was uh, all that they were, as, as it were, allowed to consume. They had to sell everything else that was more valued. Um, and so it was associated with poverty. And there is a local small scale production of this all along the coast, in all the Greek islands. No discernible Mediterranean trade in this product at all. It's all local and small scale. And on the other hand, the other source from text is a brine associated with the storage of salted fish. This is particularly tuna and mackerel. And these are, these are completely clean, all the viscera is gone. Um, they've been cleaned with salt to draw out all the blood. So there's no fermentation, there's no umami, and it's very, very salty. But it was consumed as a dip with oil, according to some of the elite texts, particularly the Archestratus, who's writing about fish in the Aegean and the Mediterranean in the, um, uh, in the fourth century BC. There is a widespread trade in this product because much of the mackerel and tuna 
that is that this this brine comes from is caught and salted in the Black Sea and um, Spain and North Africa, so southern Spain and North Africa. So the journey of this cleaned fish in its brine, we roughly guess three months. Uh, it's very hard to tell. Um, all the flavour of the brine, all the fl flavour of the fish is imparted to, to the brine. The fish is then sold as fish and the brine then becomes a commodity. So we first hear about this, this brine in this wonderful passage from Aristophanes. The chorus in a, in a, in a, in a, in a Greek drama sort of push the story forward by singing uh, parts of the plot, but also commenting on what's gone before. And in this particular part of the chorus, they recite a list of repetitive, noisy actions that go on in the kitchen. Food is a huge part of Aristophanes and plays and all kinds of all kinds of Greek drama. These these noisy, repetitive actions are fanning the fire, kneading the bread and beating the Thassian brine with oily headdress. So the Greek is very hard to translate. This is as, as good as it gets, but the actual um, headdress that is something that a woman would have worn at a ceremony. But obviously it's a vinaigrette. You've got a layer of oil on the top and you've got the brine underneath and you beat it to make an emulsion before you dip your food in it. So we've got a proto vinaigrette in fifth century Athens. This obviously um, remains the elite source for some time. But alongside this, 4th century Athens, Philoxenus is a, a food writer. And according to Athenaeus, he tells us that this guy used to walk uninvited into other people's homes to season whatever was being cooked. The, or the cooks in these homes were slaves, but they were also considered to be unskilled cooks. So he, he believed that he could do better. So he used to walk in and push them aside and say, hey, and he would season the food he found with oil, with garros, with wine and with vinegar so that he could create the seasonings of the household cooks. And then he would sit down to eat uninvited as well. So garros has apparently evolved from this thick relish like paste eaten with bread into something more readily used as a seasoning. Uh, and so Possibly, if, if you put salt and fish together, you do get a liquor and, and a paste. They separate out over time. And so instead of using the paste, they start to use the liquor. Then it becomes, it's full of umami. So the magic of umami has appeared in Greek cuisine and it's described as being tasty and useful. So you find a very similar commodity in the Philippines called bagung or patis. And this is, this is made with undervalued tiny fish, anchovy, but also sardine and lots and lots of baby fish. And it's a paste that also generates a liquid. And different parts of the Philippines and in different families in the Philippines, you find some families want the paste and are not so keen on the, on the liquor and, and some prefer the liquor and not so much the paste. It just depends on what you're, how you're introduced to it. So this kind of product, producing a paste, which we find described in Plautus, being used um, to dip vegetables in and to dip um, um, stale ham. <laughs> Somebody is offered some stale ham in, in, in a Plautus play, and he's rather uh, appalled at this because he can smell and hear fresh meat being cooking inside the house. And he, he says, have you got any Alec to go with it? Alec is the name of the fish paste. Um, so it's being consumed in Rome because we know from Plautus's place that it is. And obviously garros is transliterated into garum. There's only one source and so it's a natural transliteration and a translation. And it becomes integral to Hellenistic elite cuisine that arrived in Rome. But did the Romans consume some kind of fish sauce before this happened, before this elite view of food happened. Uh, the Romans viewed themselves as porridge eating barbarians with an unsophisticated palate. And so uh, uh, according to uh, 
Plautus and uh, other writers, they had a very, very dull diet before they were introduced to cuisine, Hellenistic cuisine. Um, so this is a quote from Pliny, which is fascinating. Nor did the people approve very highly of cabbage as they do now. Pliny's writing in 50 AD, so they like cabbage in 50 AD, since they condemned a pormentaria. Pormentaria is the Latin word for a relish, which you eat with bread. They condemned a pormentaria, which needed other pormentaria, other relishes to get them down. That means sparing the oil, for the desire for garum was a matter of disapproval. Difficult to unpick, but basically, to eat cabbage, you need to have a sauce with it, a dressing with it, a vinaigrette with it, and that means oil and fish sauce. And you didn't consume fish sauce because it was elite, it was Hellenistic, and we don't like Hellenistic things. Ordinary Romans looked down on things Hellenistic because they were a corruption of the Republican ideal of the porridge eating barbarian. So it looks as if early Romans probably didn't consume fish sauce in this way. There, but it's also very likely that right around the coast of Italy, small fishing communities, the tiny fish were turned into something that was consumed by poor people. But the elite liquor, this amber liquor, was not part of the um, cuisine of most people. So, so these two sources became fashionable on the tables of the elite, and they were blended into what, what later Thank you. 